Fur is one of the most beautiful and fascinating aspects of animals, from the long silky coat of the ragdoll cat, the almost human hair quality of Yorkshire Terriers, and the softness of a baby rabbit. Fur can be an incredibly fascinating, if not complex topic when it comes to its depiction through art. Today, I want to take you through my own techniques for tackling this. Fur is one of my favorite things to paint and draw, but I struggled with it for years and I'm still learning. My favorite resources have been to simply study from photos, live animals, and while I'm adamantly against the industry for fur trade, and I don't endorse needless killing, having a couple of pelts obtained from humane resources has also provided me with an incredible resource to the fascinating and beautiful structure of the fur, because I can manipulate it with my own hands in order to study its complexity. There are a vast variety of different types of fur in the animal kingdom, from the rough hair of a boar to the velvety soft pelt of a chinchilla. All types of fur are still the same chemically, but their techniques can vary when it comes to capturing them with paint. Here are a few examples of various types of fur painted in my style. This tutorial will be a simple introduction to my techniques for painting fur in general. More detailed tutorials on individual animals may come in the future if there is interest, but for now, I hope you find this helpful. Before we get started, a few quick tips on how I usually paint fur. These examples were made with a mix of burgundy yellow ochre, carbazole violet, and Prussian blue paint. First, I usually set down a light base layer. You can think of this as the animal's undercoat. It will also represent the highlighted sections of fur. I then go in with a slightly darker value, in this case a mix of yellow ochre and carbazole violet, and start blocking in the basic shapes of the fur. For longer fur, I am thinking of elongated triangles, where the point of the triangle represents the base where the hairs grow out of the skin and then sweep outward. You may also draw these little segments with a more pointed end, like a diamond or an arrow shape which you especially find on wet fur. A mixture of loose strands and chunked segments creates more realism. For shorter fur, I begin the same way, by laying down lighter, watered-down ochre color, and then blocking in some small, rectangular shapes. Short hair is not prone to forming quite as many small segments when compared with longer fur, although it can happen, particularly on parts of the body where the hair changes in direction due to a limb or prominent muscle or even when an animal performs certain movements that make the hair shift. I personally love fur with a lot of texture, and so I will sometimes exaggerate and stylize it unrealistically for aesthetic purposes. Although recently, I have been wanting to do more realism studies of specific fur types in order to get new ideas for how I can depict them in my own work. For softer fur, I'm using a little bit less contrast and not as sharp of lines, and trying to think in terms of keeping a cloudy feeling in the overall texture. When I lay down more crisp lines, I will go back in with a slightly damp brush and blur them out by gently rubbing it over the surface. This softens the overall look. I almost always finish up with a bit of white gouache in order to give the fur a bit more texture and interest. For areas where I want a lot of shadow, such as between chunks of fur, I am adding a bit of Prussian blue to my mix of paint to give the shadow a cooler shade. After blocking in my basic shapes, I will continue going in with darker and darker values of paint, which means adding more of the violet to my ochre in this case, and using thinner and thinner lines. The initial steps, when blocking in shapes and laying down the base layer, were done using a slightly more damp, but not dripping, brush, whereas the fine details require an almost dry brush in order to get those small, fine lines. These are my basic techniques for painting fur. Although being a somewhat abstract personality, I will sometimes change things up a bit. The main thing I recommend avoiding is using too wet of a brush, being too heavy-handed, or using too much paint, all of which can cause you to create overly thick lines. I'll talk a bit more about these things later, but hopefully this gives you somewhat of an idea of how I generally create fur from start to finish. Doing little practice sections like this is incredibly helpful. I had a great time doing them for this tutorial and would encourage you to do the same, as isolating textures of fur into one small space creates a safe zone to concentrate and focus in on your work without having to worry about doing an entire painting. If you do create any studies like this, I would love to see them. We are going to start by painting this little antlered wolf pup. She was inspired by a character belonging to my husband, but I wanted to paint her as a baby. I also chose to paint this one on paper, 
which as you may know, is a little less common for my technique as I usually paint on prepared birch panels or other surfaces. But as I know most of you use paper, I wanted to show that many of the techniques I mentioned can be adapted to work perfectly fine on any surface. So baby animals such as puppies tend to be born with a single layer of fur, which is usually softer and very fuzzy, meaning that it can kind of stick out all around their bodies in a thin, cloudy layer, as opposed to having a defined shape and weight like adult fur. As they develop, they shed this fur into an adult coat, which is much less soft and usually a bit thicker. I chose to paint this pup with slightly more adult fur for textural purposes, but I tried to keep that somewhat fuzzy feeling present. Look at a picture of a baby wolf with an adult wolf, and notice that the wolf pup's coat appears soft, fuzzy, and even lacking in detail, compared with the adult's coat which is richly detailed with thicker strands of fur and lots of almost feathery looking chunks. Keep this in mind if you wish to create a realistic distinction in age for an animal you are painting is an excellent trick for creating more realistic fantasy creatures. So right now what I am doing is basically just kind of blocking in all the shapes, getting some of that anatomy defined, and adding in some of the shadows. Usually I will start with the lightest undercoat first, the kind of golden color you saw me lay on, and then I'm going in and adding the shadows, which I'm using more of a violet color for to give it a bit of a cooler tone for a bit more realism. Now I've begun to add in just a little bit more refined detail, slowly starting to block in some of those basic fur shapes. Now I'm going in with a little bit more of a dry brushing technique to add in some of those smaller details. This picture is a little bit small in and of itself, so I'm not trying to get every single strand of hair in there, but more to create the impression of a lot of texture and character despite the size of the painting. Notice the little scale type shapes I occasionally add into the fur? Those are the feathery chunks I mentioned before. A great deal of mammals such as wolverines, bears, wolves, and so many more have a sort of medium length of fur that can often be seen forming beautiful, almost feather-like chunks. This happens when strands of hair stick together and is particularly noticeable when the animal is wet or when their fur is recently dried or when it is less clean. I'm really fond of this look so I sometimes add quite a lot of it to my characters, although that may not always be realistic. For instance, you would think that wolf fur would be very similar in appearance to fox fur, but I feel that it tends to form a few less of those feathery chunks. A wolf's entire body of fur can appear to contain many small segments of compressed hair, while foxes can often seem a bit silkier and more smooth. There are definitely exceptions to this though, so you can choose to paint this type of hair more or less silky. Foxes bred for their fur and arctic foxes have a much softer, more dense coat and thus seem to have less of these feathery segments. You can simply use these differences in your art if you want to give a little bit more of a specific character distinction between your animals. I like to think of a scale or fishnet-like pattern when drawing fur like this. That way I remember to draw those larger chunks. With this kind of fur, a great variety of textures is helpful for giving more believability and interest. So for the final touches, I am just going in with my almost dry size 10 zero brush and painting in those tiny little individual strands of fur. For me, it is important to find the balance between tons of detail without oversaturation so as to create a comfortable weight between elements. Once all the fur is painted, I will go in with another barely damp brush with a very dull tip and gently scrub over the tiny fur strands I painted in order to blur them and give the fur a more cloudy and downy appearance to suggest that absolute softness you find in puppy fur. What I am doing now is going in and defining more of that soft halo that is appearing around her whole body. Hair kind of has a tendency to have light shining through it, so if the light is coming from behind your character, it's going to form this beautiful sort of rim light through the fur. It can look really stunning if done right, and help give your character super sunny, kind of magical appearance I find.
And as a final touch, I am just going in with some white gouache to add in a few highlights and show some individual strands of hair that have gotten caught in the sunlight. I hope you enjoyed this little wolf pup. Now we will move on to the next piece. This painting features a concept for a character from my upcoming solo show, Mountain Kalia, at Valkyrie Gallery. I have not yet decided how I want her to look, so doing smaller paintings like this is a great way for me to experiment with ideas. Most of the characters in this show are symbolic enough that I feel fluctuation in their design is not very important, as it is their symbolism which really counts. This piece shows a lot of stylized anatomy and fur, so I thought it would be fun for us to talk about the things I chose to do versus what would have been realistic to do. First off, I am painting her on a prepared panel. The panel was actually just what came in the back of a shadow box I bought, so one of those little particle board type panels. It was originally covered in fabric, which I had to cut off. I then prepared it with some Daniel Smith watercolor ground in buff titanium, followed by a layer of Daniel Smith titanium white, and finally a layer of QOR watercolor ground. If you are preparing another surface, you do not need to use all three of those. One will do just fine as long as you use a couple of layers. But I was fairly attached to that mix for a while as it helped me accomplish just the right absorbency in my surface and the mix of grounds made for a pleasing effect when using paint. I will be doing a much more in-depth review on grounds in the future, so I will not go into too much detail about them here. But should you choose to use this method, this is how I did it. I want to also mention that for the third and final layer, which again was done with the QOR ground, I used a sponge, first to swirl it on smooth, and then to press it to the wet surface over and over, forming a strong, almost stone-like texture, which I will often make more or less present on my surfaces depending on the effect I wanted. Adding that texture can really help the paint cling to the surface and make the surface not only more absorbent, but also more interesting. As you can see, I started just like with the wolf pup, laying down some light layers of paint, which were made up of yellow ochre mostly, and then going in with those carbazole violet shadows. The reason I use the violet in the shadows again is to give them a little bit of a cooler look, which can create some more realism. I also lightly outline some of the muscles and anatomy, and kind of give myself a blueprint for what I want to do and follow up with. At this point, I'm going in and starting to block in a little bit of the detail and some of the small, basic feathery chunks of fur. So let's have some fur talk. When you think of a creature like a rabbit, you probably think of something rather soft, right? It is no secret that rabbits and chinchillas in particular are known to be some of the softest animals on Earth. Chinchillas have extremely dense coats to keep them warm on their natural home in the Andes Mountains in South America. Rabbits generally have longer hair, which is nonetheless soft, but can be depicted with longer lines. Keeping the lines slightly blurrier and less defined gives the impression of softness. On the opposite end, you get animals with very coarse fur, such as boars, coipus, also known as nutrias, and even sloths, which all have really coarse hair. I like to portray this kind of hair with rough lines, leaving the end of each strand fairly dull. In the case of a boar, I might stylize him with squared off chunks of hair to exaggerate the texture and give my viewers a better idea of how he would feel. This jackalope has something in between soft and coarse hair. Because I take a lot of my fur inspiration from wolves, I like to portray a kind of medium texture. Something not too cottony, but not necessarily really rough and squared off either. I like leaving those big feathery chunks present and doing lots of individual little fur details. I don't know why, it's just something I've always enjoyed. You might also notice that I sometimes tend to paint a little bit less detail on the limbs and features that are a little bit further away from the viewer. This is because I like the sensation of smokiness and depth. Obviously, if you look at an animal in real life, 
you're most likely going to see more detail on their opposite legs and limbs than you would in my paintings and in many other artists' work, but I just love the stylization of leaving those inner limbs a little bit less detailed, as if the animal were floating through kind of a fog. So at this point, I am basically just filling in one tiny hair after another over the course of her entire body. As I go, I will add little highlights, textures, and shadows to create some individuality between various sections of hair and areas of muscle and anatomy. On many animals, the fur appears to crack as it goes over areas of significant shape, such as highly defined muscles, a transition between two parts, such as the neck into the shoulders, or when their bodies change in position. It is helpful to look at photos of animals in different poses to notice the way in which the fur moves over the muscles and how it changes and cracks, depending on their pose. Also notice that fur does not tend to do this when it is very short, such as the fur of an antelope or horse with a summer coat, and even lions. As well, certain baby animals can lack this cracking feature due to the fuzzy and thin nature of their coats causing the fur to mostly blend together like a soft mist or a cloud. It can be really confusing to understand the way fur falls over anatomy, and many times in the past, this led to me playing a guessing game, mimicking random shapes I saw within the fur in an unconvincing way because I had no idea what I was drawing. The best recommendation I have is to study the muscles beneath the fur before you try to guess how the fur will go over the top of them. If you are looking at a reference of a big hairy wolverine and are wondering what is going on under all that floof, look up some skeletal and if possible, muscular references. Study many different photos to get an idea of the animal's proportions. If you want, you can even exaggerate the form and muscles a bit in your own image based on your own studies even if the image you are referencing from does not show the anatomy quite so obviously. A bit of exaggeration can often make an image more convincing and lend credit to it if the artist is obviously aware of what is happening beneath the surface of their subject. One thing I often try to avoid with animals that have short or medium fur is allowing the fur to totally disguise too many of the muscles and shapes beneath the surface. This is just personal preference. Looking up reference of real animals is of course key if you want to draw realism, but should you choose to exaggerate some features, such as the muscles beneath the fur, it is just good to be aware of the fact that you are exaggerating or stylizing them, rather than simply trying to guess. Of course, I am not absent from the guessing game at all times, and there are many times when I will double check my anatomy against reference. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this, though, as I have mentioned in past videos, I sometimes see that it is a worry for certain artists, and so I like to stress that you cannot learn from nothing. The great master painters certainly did not pull ideas purely from their own imaginations, but rather spent countless hours studying from real life environments, models, and even cadavers, which is just incredible. We are so blessed to have the internet where we can just Google rabbit muscles and find a whole treasure trove of reference, so why not use it? I know I personally could benefit from making more time for more reference study, and so I want to encourage everyone else to do so as well.
As I finish her off, I am simply going back in and adding those final details, which might seem almost invisible, but which can make subtle and pleasing differences, such as small white highlights, more defined segments of hair, or softening up areas that are a bit too crisp. Even with fur that falls somewhere between soft and coarse like this, I'll usually soften my initial details with a barely damp brush, otherwise I feel the hair looks too overly sharpened and stiff. It is of course up to you to decide what works best in your own art, and in time, your style will likely evolve and change. I know mine certainly has, which is a good thing. I left in the background painting portion of this video at a higher speed than the rest of the footage in case anyone was interested. During this process, I worked with lots of water to create a big splashy base layer, going back in with a more dry brush to bring out small textures I found within the paint where color had settled into the little divots and holes of my surface. I also added salt to the wet layers of paint so that as it dried, they would soak up the pigments and create that beautiful starry effect that you see. I also took a semi-damp, dull brush and used it to create those long, distorted streaks that encircle the jackalope's body and come off her horns. I love to create that smoky, dissipating look, and so I purposely blur some of her edges and add splashes of gold to her body that leak out into the atmosphere. We are always in the process of constant death and rebirth at the same time, and our particles float away into the atmosphere and form new lives of their own. This is something that fascinates me deeply and I love working it into my concepts with more exaggeration, as if time has been sped up in the lives of my characters and we are seeing a still shot of their entire existence. I hope you enjoyed the process of this piece. Now we'll move on to the final one. For my final demo, I am going to be painting this weird unicorn of sorts, it was also part of my upcoming Mountain Collier show. Unlike the last piece, I begin this one by painting in the background first, which is how I generally do things, though I do like to shake it up for a challenge from time to time, which is why in the last painting I started with the character first. The reason I often do the background first is because it gives me a really good foundation of value and color to match my character against, which I personally find more agreeable than if I paint the character first and then attempt to match the background to them. Painting the background first helps me get ideas for what colors I will be mixing into my shadows and highlights, and how light or dark my character should be against the background. As you might have noticed at the beginning, I did this piece on an extremely textured surface, full of tiny craters. This was so that I could enjoy bringing out all the little details and natural textures, since I was keeping the background somewhat abstract. As always, I start with a lighter layer of paint for the undercoat. In this case, her fur was painted with my hand-mixed black, or shadow shade, made up of burgundy yellow ochre, carbazole violet, and Prussian blue. Before painting a base layer on her face, I decided to go in and give myself a blueprint of the various facial features, which are the main focus of this piece, as the rest of her neck, while furry, was kept fairly abstract because this piece is more of a concept painting for a larger piece I would love to do in the future. The reason I did this before painting in a base layer was because I did not want the very light graphite I had originally put down for her facial features to be washed away with the base layer paint. With the base layer down, I began to block in the shadows that will be present within the fur. Because she is fairly monochrome, I am basically just using a more concentrated version of my black by mixing it with less water. I will later go in and update the shadows and highlights with a few other colors, but for now, I am mostly focused on obtaining the values I want. With the basic shadows set, I begin painting in her fur using somewhat long, dry brush strokes with my small 10-0 brush. Short furred animals, such as horses, cattle, and even some big cats, have very short strands of fur, at least in the summer or warmer climates, which lay flat against their muscles allowing you to see far more of what is happening beneath the surface. 
Animals like this are usually easy enough to paint without drawing the individual strands of hair because they are difficult to see, even in person without being close up. If you do choose to paint these strands, I recommend saving them for closer views such as portraits. Otherwise, the animal might come across a bit fluffier than you want. Of course, horses do get fuzzier in the winter, and some breeds look much furrier, such as the Bashkir Curlies, which have very curly yet fairly short hair, or the Shetland Pony, which can have short hair like their larger relatives, but which can also be seen with very long hair, and are often depicted in art with this type of coat. For this particular character, who fluctuates between feminine and masculine, I am still in the process of experimenting with their design, but one thing that has stayed with me is the idea of making them particularly furry. I wanted them to have a feeling of both equine and servine anatomy, so horses and deer, but I am looking in to add a bit of a goat-like feeling as well. One thing I particularly want out of this character is a deep stylization and a liquid kind of feeling to their anatomy. I chose to give them long, long fur on their neck, and a particularly hairy face. With the face, I still tried to keep with some of the realistic hair growth directions while adding my own style. Once more, it is important to remember when painting in those tiny little strands of fur not to use too much water in your brush. One of the number one questions I am asked about my work is how to get the lines so fine, and all it really takes is to use the right balance of water. For lines like these, the brush is only just barely wet, wet enough to be able to spread the length of the line I need, but dry enough to make sure that the paint within those lines cannot thicken and spread. It takes some getting used to, and my best recommendation for achieving these thin lines is practice, practice, practice. Boring answer, right? But it is definitely true. However, there are a couple of things to keep in mind alongside that, such as how light you are with your brush hand, the type of paint you are using, and the nature of your brush itself. Learning to keep your hand light while holding it steady enough to achieve quick, sharp lines is where the practice comes in. Finding the right balance of water to brush also becomes intuitive after a while. Different types of paint might have subtle differences in how they react and how much water they require. Again, lots of practice will help you get well acquainted with your medium and in time you will be able to figure out a way to get around the quirks of different watercolor brands, at least for the most part. I also recommend using a brush which is in good shape, no dull or bent tips if possible, because they truly hinder your process. I tend to go through small brushes somewhat quickly, no matter the quality, a habit which I am hoping to remedy at some point because I hate having to buy a new detail brush every few paintings and will often overuse my detail brushes well past their prime. A good use for a detail brush once it has retired from doing fine detail is to use it as a detail scrubber something you can use to scrub away fine highlights and lines of paint, or to soften and blur small sections of paint, as you have seen me do so many times now to dull down the crisp textures of the fur. Small, dull brushes are still incredibly useful, even if not for doing the finest of details anymore. As I continue painting this character, I will gradually unravel their design, but in the meantime, there's so many things to think about when stylizing and giving a character personality, and it is amazing how much the texture of their fur can help with that. For instance, I feel that a messy, feathery texture can make the animal look a bit more wild and rough. You can even use fur textures to give a creature a more feminine or masculine feeling. Does the fur have a lot more of a square edge to it, or is it more soft and curved like female anatomy tends to be in humans? 
These subconscious messages can be great for creating a creature with a lot of character. I hope these demos have been helpful to you. As far as one of my favorite subjects, you can count on more demos in the future. Before I go, I wanted to mention something important. Never feel bad if, as you are practicing your own techniques, you are constantly seemingly forgetting how to paint. I know it took me years to get anywhere with painting fur, and even still, there is so much I want to learn in order to make it stronger feature in my work. Take the time to do focused, applied practices. If you want to paint something well, start being very aware of it in your own everyday life. If you have pets, observe them. See how their coats move and shift like water with every movement. Note the different textures of the animals you see and try to find things in common between them, as well as the differences. Once you set your mind to something, you can start to put it into your everyday habits and you will get better, I promise. Have a beautiful day or night wherever you are and be sure to show me your furry paintings because I would love to see them. Be well, bye.